Well, hopefully you either got the email or saw on Sakai, but we graded homework two Monday night. It's out of 85, which I think we forgot to note at the top of the assignment. If you have any questions about that particular homework or if you didn't get it, let us know. And also, as I said in the email, there's a couple people who haven't turned it in yet, so please don't go emailing the solutions to the class list serve or anything like that. Keep them to yourself for the time being. Today, we're going to discuss strategies for when you're testing multiple hypotheses. This is another item that generally isn't part of a traditional curriculum in introductory statistics, but in modern biological sciences, particularly modern genetics, you run into this problem all the time. So I figured it was worth at least briefly introducing you to the issues. Uh, it's another thing that I'm not going to emphasize a huge amount, but it's important to know about when you write your own papers and so forth, so at least you know who to ask for help when you run into this problem. So first of all, a brief review of the problem in the first place, that recall under the general hypothesis testing framework, we, there are two different types of errors in hypothesis testing. Type 1 error means that you reject the null hypothesis when it's true, and type 2 error means you fail to reject the null hypothesis when it's false. And the standard statistical paradigm is the type 1 error is considered to be worse, so you want to make set the probability of type 1 error to be some small value. You don't want to accidentally publish spurious findings. So the convention in the scientific world is that if your p-value, i.e. the probability of observing your test statistic or a more extreme test statistic under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true is less than 0.05, then you reject the null hypothesis. That implies that assuming the assumptions of your test are satisfied, that the probability of type 1 error should be less than 5%. And this is fine if you're just testing a single hypothesis, but it can lead to problems if you're testing multiple hypotheses. That an example that I've used a couple times in this class was a famous dot experiment in the psychological world they were trying to find psychological characteristics associated with schizophrenia. And so they g gave a psychological questionnaire to 100 questions to, patient, to schizophrenia patients and matched controls. And they found that for four of these 100 questions, the response were significantly different at the P less than 0.05 level. They ran out and published the results, and these results were never replicated. What's the problem? Well, hopefully you see it already because I've used this example a time or two in the past. That when you perform multiple hypothesis tests, the probability of type 1 error is much greater than 0.05. When you do, when you do 100 hypothesis tests, you would expect about 5% of the tests, that is about 5 to be significant at the 0.05 level just by chance, and when you get 4 out of 100, that's consistent with what you expect. And if you're doing modern high-throughput genetics, where you're doing thousands or millions of tests, then this is an even bigger problem. And in theory, people should be aware of this, but you would be astonished. I heard a talk a while back, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry, but they, it was a representative from some drug company trying to explain the challenges of de devising new experience, spear, or devising new drugs, and said, well, we first looked at 50,000 possible drug targets in our initial screen. About 2,500 of them passed the initial screen at the 0.05 level. Then about 125 of those passed the secondary screen for verification. Then among those, 
we had about 25 that made it into phase one and two, only two that made it into phase two. I'm just sitting here. Hmm. You were using a 0.05 cutoff at every single level of this. In each level of the process, about 5% survived. Remarkable. So, yeah, it's important to know these things, particularly if you work for drug companies, so you don't piss away millions of dollars chasing after ghosts. So, the question then becomes, how do we control for type 1 error in this level while still keeping type 2 air at a reasonable level. So, the simple solution and probably the most commonly used solution, despite the fact that, in my opinion, it has some very serious shortcomings that I'll describe in a second, is what's called the bond Bonferroni correction. Is your recall from when we discussed probability that if A1 and A2 were any two events, then the probability of A1 or A2 is the probability of A1 plus the probability of A2 minus the probability of both A1 and A2. And since the probability of A1 and A2 is always non-negative, you can conclude from that the probability of A1 or A2 is less than or equal to the probability of A1 plus the probability of A2. So, you can easily generalize that to n events, that the probability of A1 or A2 or AN of getting at least one of these events out of the n events is just less than or equal to the probability of the individual events. And the way that you can use this to solve the multiple hypothesis testing problem is if you want to say the probability of at least one type 1 error in your n hypothesis test, that is, the probability if you make a type 1 error on your first test, plus the probability if you make a type 1 error on your second test, plus the probability of type 1 error on your third test up to your nth test, is going to be less than or equal to the sum of the individual probabilities of type 1 error. The probability of type 1 error on the first trial, plus the probability of type 1 error on the second trial, up to the probability of type 1 error on the nth trial. And that implies that if rather than using a cutoff of alpha, and practice alpha is almost always 0.05, rather than using a cutoff of 0.05 for statistical significance, if you use 0.05 divided by n, then that pro implies the probability of at least one type 1 error is going to be less than or equal to 0.05 times n divided by n, or in other words, is 0.05. The implication is that if you want to make sure the probability of making at least one type 1 error is less than 0.05, for each of your n hypotheses, you require p less than 0.05 divided by n to be statistically significant. And advantages and disadvantages of this is, I mean, number one, it solves the problem. You, if you do this, in theory, you don't have to worry about publishing false results, or at least pu publishing false results just due to spurious, spuriously significant results. And this is, unfortunately, still far and away the most commonly used approach particularly in the world of genome-wide association studies. In my experience, it's practically the only approach that gets used, particularly in higher impact journals. And, I mean, if you want to be absolutely certain that there are no false positives in all of your multiple tests, it's really the only way to do this. I mean, people have figured out a couple ways that are slightly more sophisticated, but, I mean, they don't buy you that much more power than a simple bond for oni correction, and they're generally closely related to the simple bond for oni correction I just described to you. There's only one disadvantage, but unfortunately it's a major one, is that you get a, v a very big loss of power. That is an increase in the probability of type 2 error. That, I mean, if you look at genome-wide association studies in particular, that Basically, the standard in the top tier journals, the science, nature, cell type of journals, they won't publish GWAS result unless you have like P less than 10 to the minus 8 is 
the existing convention in the literature. And that means that essentially you can't do a genome-wide association study unless you can include thousands of people in your study and be willing to spend millions of dollars to do it, which to me is a major loss to the scientific world. The, the top journals are so uptight about this sort of thing, but I mean it's the way the world is. And if you don't have the luxury of being an established senior investigator with more money than God, then doing something like this may simply not be an option. If you only have a couple dozen or a couple hundred people in your sample and you want to test a bunch of hypotheses, in that case you either need to throw up your hands and say the problem's impossible and retire from science, or you need to consider another approach. So I'll descri briefly describe a couple other approaches today. And this multiple hypothesis testing problem in general is tricky. It's actually still a fairly active research area in the statistical world. I mean, when I teach this lecture, I always tell the story that one of the first seminal papers on multiple hypothesis testing was published in the Journal of the American Statistical Association by Benjamini and Holtberg, and they gave an exam. This was like, I think sometime in like the early to mid-90s that they published this, and they gave an example in their paper where they performed 20 hypothesis tests, and apparently a reviewer got really angry about this, saying that was unrealistic because nobody ever performs 20 hypothesis tests in one experiment. <laughs> and yeah, if you've ever worked on GWAS nowadays where people perform like a million plus hypothesis tests, you see how quickly the world changes in 20 years. But the point is, this is still an active research area, not a solved problem. If you run into this problem, particularly in an expensive genetics experiment, it's worthwhile talking to a professional statistician who does this sort of thing for a living. That said, I wanted you to at least be aware of the various issues that are out there. And, yeah, and it always amazes me that I managed to say what's on the next slide, even when I can only see one slide at a time in Keynote, so I guess I just went on this whole rant, so I don't need to say it again, but, yeah. Okay, so, some other approaches to deal with the multiple hypothesis testing problem is sometimes you may not want you may not necessarily need to bet the farm that a particular hypothesis test is significant. Sometimes you may want to just look at kind of an omnibus null hypothesis that we're seeing more significant results than we would expect to see by chance or to thing that like say you have metastatic tumors and non-metastatic tumors and you just and you have gene expression data on the two types of tumors, you want to say, are there differences in gene expression between metastatic and non-metastatic tumors? Or if you work in chronic pain like I do, say you've genotyped some SNPs and some target genes in chronic pain patients and some in controls, you want to say, is there a genetic association to chronic pain? So rather than posing a question that, is this one particular test significant, the question then becomes, do we see more significant tests than we would expect to see if the data were truly random? So to give a little theoretical background for this, I'll briefly describe a distribution that's useful sometimes in statistics, like in this particular context called the uniform distribution, which is <coughs> random variable has a uniform distribution on 0, 1. It's a continuous distribution that's equally likely to be any value between 0 and 1. So if a null hypothesis is true, that there's no association between a gene and a disease, for instance, then the p-value for the test for testing the null hypothesis of no association should have a uniform 0-1 distribution. It, is, it should be equally likely to be any number between 0 and 1. 
And the implication of this is that if you do a bunch of tests and the distribution of the p-values is non-uniform, that is, if you see a disproportionate number of tests with small p-values, then that implies that at least some of the tests are probably significant, even if you can't necessarily say which ones. So, to test the composite null hypothesis that are we seeing a disproportionate number of tests with significant p-values, what you can do is just calculate a p-value for each test one at a time, then see if the set of p-values has a uniform distribution. That basically, if you see a disproportionate number of p-values that are close to zero, that implies this composite null hypothesis is false, and that uh, at least some of the tests are significant. So how can you do that? Well, one of a simple approach is to just calculate all the p-values, then draw a histogram of the p-values. That if every single one of your null hypotheses, hypotheses is true, then your p-values should be uniform on 0 to 1. But if you draw a histogram of the p-values, it should be pretty much flat. It should look something like this with all the boxes roughly equal height. Now, they're obviously not going to be exactly equal height, but here I just randomly generated 10,000 uniform random variables and did a histogram, and you see it's pretty much flat here. Um, I guess, quick little note in R, I don't know that you'll ever need to use that, this in this class, but in case you ever do, this command R unif generates a, ve a vector of length n consisting of uniform 0, 1 random numbers. If you need to create, generate uniform random numbers on an interval other than 0, 1, you can also specify a minimum and a maximum. Like I said, if you ever need to use a random number generator in R, that's how you do it, but it's not something that I'll probably ever ask you to do. And on the other hand, if you plot your histogram of p-values and it looks something like this, that most definitely is not flat. We see far more p we see far more tests with small p-values than you would expect to see uh, if the null hypothesis were true, or, or if the omnibus null hypothesis is true, or true. That if the omnibus null hypothesis were true, this would be flat. Here, it's definitely not flat. We see a bunch of p-values close to zero, implying that some of these tests should be truly significant. In this case, basically, the truth be told, this comes from a genome-wide association data set that I analyzed and messed up so that there was some confounding that led to a lot more significant tests than there should be. But the point is, if you see something like this, some of your null hypotheses are true. When I corrected for the confounding, then my histogram of p-values looked more like this, which is more believable in a GWAS study. Here you see it's pretty much flat, except for right next to zero, there's a slight bump indicating that we're getting slightly more p-values called significant than we would expect to see by chance. It, some of these associations may not be super strong. You would have a hard time pointing at any one SNP and saying this SNP is an important one, but it's clearly not flat. There's clearly a spike close to zero, indicating that there is probably some association between that at least some of the null hypotheses should be rejected in this case. Another way that you can test this omnibus null hypothesis that all of your null hypotheses are true is to do is to plot QQ plots. You'll recall we discussed this briefly a few weeks back. We wanted to see if the data was normally distributed. In that case, we would plot the quantiles of a given data set versus the quantiles of the normal distribution. 
and if the date is normally distributed, then the <coughs> that QQ plot should be a straight line. And so, in this case, if we wanted to test the omnibus null hypothesis that all of our null hypotheses are true, that is, that our p-values have a uniform distribution, you can plot the quantiles of your p-values against the quantiles of a uniform random variable on 0 to 1. So, basically, to to do a SNR, I assume that we have a CSV file with a list of p-values in it. I read in the p-values, then I use this qqplot command that I say, the qqplot command, we've used it before, that um, the first is basically you give it two data sets, it plots the quantiles of one data set against the quantiles of another data set. If the two data sets have the same distribution, it should be a straight line. So I give it the first data set, which is the set of p values. Then I, for the second argument, rather than just randomly generating uniform random numbers, I just create an evenly spaced sequence from 0 to 1 with the same length as the vector of p values. We had about a million of them in this case. And then I use this AB line command that plots the line that the data should be on if the two distributions were exactly identical. And the plot looks something like this. The red line shows a plot of the QQ plot of the p-values versus the quantiles of uniform 0, 1 random variable. And the black line shows where what the QQ plot should be if the distributions were identical. Here you see that for any given level of p-value, we see more <coughs> we see more p-values we see more p-values less than 0.05 or less than 0.1 or whatever cutoff that you would want to use than we should have seen if the data were truly uniformly distributed on 0, 1. This implies once again that the distribution of the p-values is not uniformly distributed and hence at least some of the null hypotheses are false and you can reject the omnibus null hypothesis that they're all true. And the new R commands here, QQ plot in general, if you go QQ plot of X comma Y, it plots the quantiles of X against the quantiles of Y. In general, you use it for determining if X and Y have the same distribution. As you'll recall before, we used a variant of this command called QQ norm. Since testing if the data is normally distributed is the most common use for this, there's a special command for it in R. But if you want to do a QQ plot for some distribution other than normal distribution, you can use QQ plot of X and Y, and it will do it for any two data sets, X and Y. The seek command, we say from A to B length C, that will generate a sequence of evenly spaced numbers between A and B of length C. We used it on the earlier slide to generate our uniform data. We said from 0 to 1 with a length of the number of p-values that you evaluated. And you also notice that in, when I plotted on the previous slide, I said plot these points, and then I said PCH equals dot. By default, when you do a plot in R, the points at plots will be a small circle. When you're plotting a million points, that gets messy and hard to read. So if you say PCH equals dot, then that tells R to plot a small dot rather than a bigger circle, which can make your graph easier to read sometimes. That's just FYI, if you ever use R to create graphs for a paper or something, you also notice I passed this command 
COL equals red, that stands for color equals red, that shockingly enough tells R to plot the points or lines in red rather than the default of black. Again, none of this is stuff that you're going to be tested on or anything. Just if you're using R for something where it's important that the picture look nice, that's how you do it. And this command in R, A, B line of A, B, that prints a line with slope B and Y intercept of A. So in other words, if you say A, B line 0, 1, like I did a few slides back, that will print a line with a slope of 1 and a Y intercept of 0, which is the line that the points should fall on if the data were truly uniformly distributed. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this testing this omnibus null hypothesis? Well, advantage, it's a piece of cake to do, and it also gives you vastly greater power than the Bonferroni approach. It's very easy to construct examples where none of your p-values meet a Bonferroni cutoff, but if you look at the histogram or QQ plot, you can see that the distribution of the p-values is non-uniform. In fact, the data that I used in, to create these slides came from a genome-wide association study where none of the p-values beat the 10 to the minus 8 cutoff that makes the top-tier journals happy. But if you look at the distribution of the p-values, there's clearly something going on there the p-values are not all uniform. The big disadvantage here is that a high percentage of the time this omnibus null hypothesis is not the null hypothesis that you want to test. In particular, generally given the doing a GWAS these days costs millions of dollars, you're not going to have much luck getting the NIH to give you money to do a GWAS unless there's very strong evidence that the disease is already genetic. And if the NIH gives you millions of dollars to do a GWAS and you can say at the end of the study, hey guys, guess what? I discovered there's a genetic basis for heart disease. They're going to be like, yeah, thank you for spending $5 million to figure that out they're not going to care that there's a genetic association, that's well known, that what they want to know about is what's a particular gene that's associated with heart disease, and <coughs> you can't, and using this omnibus null hypothesis approach, you won't answer that question most of the time and have to consider other approaches. But, I mean, if you've just done, like, a quick and dirty exploratory analysis, looked at a bunch of variables and want to answer the question, is there any association between these variables and the outcome, then you or let's say, is there anything going on here? Is it worth doing a follow-up study on some of the biggest hits? to see if the result can be replicated, this approach is a good way to do that. And another alternative for dealing with this problem of multiple hypothesis testing is to calculate what's known as the false discovery rate. And this, at least if you do like gene expression microarrays or RNA-seq or anything like that, this actually gets used a fair amount these days. And I mean, I think it's a fairly good idea, as I'll describe here in a second. And basically, the idea behind calculating the false discovery rate is say that you perform n hypothesis tests and call r of the results significant according to whatever p value cutoff you want to use. And then suppose that of these r results that you call significant, v of them are false positives then the expected value of the proportion of false positives, that is the number of false positives divided by the total number of things called the significant, is what's called the false discovery rate. And basically the intuition behind the false discovery rate is it's the proportion of the time that you call a test significant when the null hypothesis is actually true. 
it is the proportion of the time you call the test significant when there's actually no association between the gene and the disease or whatever the case may be. So, a uh, famous example where this methodology was used was uh, Goss et al. I think that should be Tusher et al. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote this slide. I'm going to have to fix that. But from a paper called the Significance Analysis of Microarrays, where they first proposed the software that's most commonly used to analyze microarrays nowadays, the, basically, they had eight blood samples from cancer patients, four of which were untreated, and four of which had been exposed to ionizing radiation. And the idea was they wanted to identify genes that were associated with reaction to radiation treatment. And so they, each of these eight samples was hybridized to a microarray with slightly over 7,000 genes on it, so you're doing 7,000 hypothesis tests here. And hopefully, even with just having half a semester of my class, you can see that if you have four, essentially four cases and four controls, that doesn't give you very good power to detect the difference between the two groups. And so if you use a p-value of 0.05 divided by 7,000, then you're going to find that nothing's significant and just throw up your hands and say this is impossible. But if you do that, then you don't get your paper published in good journals, which is a bad thing if you're a scientist. So how did they tackle this problem? Oh, well, basically they estimated the false discovery rate using the following procedure that Basically, for each gene, they calculated a t-statistic for testing the null hypothesis that the expression doesn't differ between the two groups. It's actually not exactly a traditional t-statistic. They made some slight modifications to the traditional t-statistic to account for the fact that you can't estimate variance very well when you only have four cases and four controls. I won't go into the details on that. If you ever have to do this in real life, you're welcome to talk to me about it. Or you can just read their original paper, or you can just download the SAM software and run the program without worrying about what's going on under the hood. But at any rate, for the sake of argument, we'll just say that they're t-statistics, and basically then what they did is they said choose some arbitrary cutoff d, call the gene significant if the t-statistic is greater than d. And that, I think, is another typo. That should probably be absolute value greater than d, but whatever. And then, basically, they did permutation tests. As I discussed on Monday's lecture, that when you have base, you're trying to do a t-test comparing four groups to four other groups, even if you... If that's probably going to be too small for the normality assumption to be satisfied, at least in some cases, especially when you do this 7,000 times. So rather than making this assumption of normality, you can get, calculate the null distribution of the T statistics by just doing permutation tests, randomly permuting the data, doing T tests on each permuted version of the data, and thereby obtaining these permuted T statistics, TI star. And basically, <coughs> to each time you permute the data, you count the number of times that one of your, you count the number of false positive, that is the number of permuted t-statistics that are greater than your cutoff d, and repeat, do like, repeat this b times, and take the number of errors for each iteration divided by the total number of iterations, that gives you an estimate of your false discovery rate. And basically, here's a uh, 
apply the I copied from the paper where this methodology was described, where basically they take the expected T statistics plotted against the observed T statistics once again if there was no association between gene expression and ionizing radiation treatment, we would expect this to be on a straight line. Quite clearly, it's not on a straight line, indicating that uh, at least some of these are likely to be significant. And in the paper, they showed that if they calculate they use this approach to calculate how many false positives you can expect to observe for a specified number of tests called significant. They found that if you used a cutoff of 0.3 for your test statistic, you would call 294 genes significant, and you would expect about 75 of them to be false positives. If you choose a more stringent cutoff, say that only if your test statistic is greater than 1, then you're only going to call 46 things significant. You would expect about four of them to be false positives. In other words, a false discovery rate of less than 10% versus up here you're getting a false discovery rate of closer to 25%. And I mean, particularly if you're just doing an exploratory analysis on a small sample size, this is pretty good. If you can say, here's a list of 46 genes, we expect that hopefully 40 plus of them truly do differ with ha, truly do have differ are differentially expressed in response to ionizing radiation there's going to be a few false positives the vast majority of them should work for many applications that's a perfectly acceptable thing and that means that now we found 40 plus genes that are highly likely to be significant, whereas if we'd used the more conservative von Feroni correction, we would have just said there's nothing significant here and had to give up. So, and this idea of the false discovery rate led to another idea called the Q value, which the Q value is sort of the multiple hypothesis testing of. Uh, of p-values, formally it's defined to be the minimum false discovery rate for a test that for which a given test can be called significant when you're doing multiple tests. So in other words, say you have a gene that has a p-value of 0 0.0001 and you calculate the q-value for that particular gene to be 0.06 what that tells you is that if you call anything that has p less than 0 0.0001 is significant, then you should have a false discovery rate of about 6%. And <coughs> so I'll briefly show how you can calculate Q values in R. This is the sort of thing that if you need help with when you're writing a paper, you can get in touch with me or your favorite statistician, but this is from this GWAS example that I showed before that say I want to find 25 smallest p-values in this data set. I can use the sort command by default that will sort the data from smallest to largest. I say give me the first 25. There's a list of our smallest p-values. And then if I say to order the data set, it also does sorting, but rather than giving me the raw numbers, it gives me the position of these p-values. In other words, that tells me the p-value number 713634 is the smallest, p-value number 546031 is the second smallest, p-value number 85687 is the third smallest, and so on down the line. I'll show you why that's useful here in a second. So sort, in general, it will sort a vector from smallest to largest, and order will return the indices of this sorted vector. And <clears throat> to calculate Q values for a given data set, you can use this Q value function 
NR, you'll have to install some special packages to use this, so I'll show you here in a second. And you also have to load into memory in R using the library Q value again. So I say Q vals. Well, the function is called Q value, and I give it a list of P values. And then to get the actual Q values, I go Q vals dollar sign Q value, and I say, give me the Q values for the 25 smallest p values, in other words, the Q values for the 25 most significant genes. And you see, end up with a list of Q values that look like this. And this is basically telling me that even if I take the top, call the top 25 genes significant, I'm getting a false discovery rate around 0 0.03, which is really quite good, all things considered. That suggests that you could take you could call these top genes significant and probably only get about 3%. That is, around 1 would be a false positive. So, you could probably go higher than 25. This is just for illustration. And given that none of these actually beat the Bonferroni correction, using this Q-value approach can buy you a lot of extra power. And... In general, in R, if you go Q value of a list of P values, that'll calculate the Q value for each P value. The output of this Q value function is a list to get the vector of P or to get the vector of Q values. The syntax is Q value object dollar sign Q value. And before you can use the Q value function in R you need to install the QValue library and just to make things extra confusing you can't do install.packages like we did for the boot library because the QValue package is part of the Bioconductor project instead of being part of CRAN which is the usual repository for our packages. For practical purposes what that means is to install the QValue library you need to first run this command, then this sourcing in some code from the Bioconductor website, and then you do this command, BioC light, telling it to install the Q value. You only need to do this once after that. It's installed, and you just need to do library Q value before you run it. Hopefully, this will be reasonably straightforward to do. But if you have any trouble installing the Q-value package on your computer, you can shoot me an email. And just to add to the confusion, past experience has shown that unless they fixed this recently, the Q-value package, if you just run it straight from Bioconductor and try to run it on, on Max, it will give you all kinds of weird errors. In order to get this to install correctly on Macs, you need to install a set of TCLTK utilities for R. I believe this is the current version at this URL. And you just download this DMG file, install it on your computer, and then the QValue package should work, or at least it has in the past. That said, if you're using a Mac or if you just have trouble getting this package to install generally, generally feel free to shoot me an email if this doesn't work because you will need this package for a couple homework problems. And in this particular example, okay, I guess there was one SNP that survived Bonferroni's correction, but as we saw from the example, I mean, we could rather than only getting one SNP that beat Bonferroni, you can get a much larger number, uh, you can call a much larger number of SNPs significant while maintaining a low false discovery rate. We're only getting a false discovery rate of 3% if we call the top 25 genes significant. We probably could have gone to the top 100 or even higher with, and still getting a decent FDR, so this false discovery rate-based approach gives you a major increase in power. So in my opinion, this approach is vastly superior to Bonferroni, and at least in the gene expression world, people use it all the time. I don't know why nobody uses it for genome-wide association studies, but whatever.
And the one problem is that <clears throat> many journals will basically only publish results if they survive a bond for ONI cutoff, and sometimes the NIH won't fund your grant unless you can show that you have power under bond for ONI. And just saying that you'll use FDR will get your grant sent back to you, which is silly in my opinion, but unfortunately that's the way the world is. Hopefully, now that you've seen this, you can, when you get on study sections and review papers and so forth, you'll know that this is legitimate methodology and won't start screaming at people who use it. Uh, things to remember for today is that if you test multiple hypotheses, the probability of at least one type 1 error is much larger than the probability of a type 1 error if you do a single test. Von Froni correction can get around this problem, but at a major cost and power. If you want to do, look at the composite null hypothesis that there's no significant test, you can just do a histogram or a QQ plot of the p-values and see if it looks like at least some of the tests are significant. And if and you can also increase bond for ONI, or you can also increase power compared to bond for ONI by looking at false discovery rate, and you can and you can calculate false discovery rates using permutation tests or using the Q value package in R. And here are the new R commands for today that I won't rehash because we're really out of time already. Any questions about any of this? And then I guess I'll put in the final reminder that the official due date for homework three is Friday. You'll get a small bonus if you turn it in by then. The Sakai will stop accepting them a week from Friday.